Erev Tov, good evening. Under the premise that Israel's education is part and parcel of Jewish education, and that Jewish education is part and parcel of education in itself, I would like to address tonight three major elements. Number one, question number one, what are the different lenses through which we came to appreciate Israel in our historical narrative? Question number two, what are the most fundamental challenges that we face today in the world of Jewish and Israel education? And question number three, what are some of the measures that I believe are important in tackling those challenges? So I will start us off with a personal story. And the personal story goes back 25 years when I was a young educator of Judaism, or the term you probably know, tour guide. <laughs> and I had the honor of having a Ramah a summer group in, uh, in Israel. And uh, it was a six-week program, and they had already been with me for three weeks, whereupon we went to the Kotel for Friday night services. I'm sure you've, many of you have done this before. Uh, and I let the boys go to the left, the girls go to the, left, uh, to the right, whereupon one of the guys, a 16-year-old Jewish guy uh, from the group, comes to me and says, Zohar, I have a question for you. I say, yeah. He says to me, you know, you're an Israeli, right? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, you're a native Israeli, right? He said, yeah. He said, you were born and raised here, right? He said, yeah. He said, okay. Have you ever seen the Kotel for the first time? As you can see, I'm not exactly a person who has a problem with words. <laughs> I was at a loss for words. And he continues. He says, you see, for me, I studied about the Western Wall. It was part of my imagination as I went to Sunday school, to Hebrew school, to this school, to that school. Even the teacher made a sheet for us and we put fake notes. So when I came to Israel for the first time, when I was 15, he says to me, I was very conscious about that moment that I met that landscape for the first time. So I give the question back to you now. Have you ever seen the Kotel for the first time? He blew me away. And he blew me away because he was a 16-year-old pitcher <laughs> who experienced something that is forever beyond my reach. My friends, at that moment, I met education for the first time. And I was caught by its captivating touch. At that moment, I was humbled because I understood one thing. Sometime you need someone else's viewpoint in order to edify your own Jewish identity. I was humbled. And indeed, that negotiation of two different landscapes, looking at the Western Wall, where we had the same view, but not the same vision, lead me today to suggest to you that there are at least five different landscapes of Israel that governed our shared identity. The first one starts when we are forged into a nation in the Exodus, and we actually hear about the land of Israel being introduced to the people of Israel in great detail, yet without having experienced it yet. Israel at that juncture is an imagined land, where the byword in the Torah is kitavo. Once you arrive to that land, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but the people are listening to the Torah and to the word of God through Moses. All they see around them is not Israel. And even the God of Israel continues to say, this is not a land like the land of Egypt from whence you came. It is a land whose God I is set upon from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. It is a land imagined. In the book of Joshua, we move from an imagined land to a covenantal land. It is not just a landscape. It is not just the geography upon which Jews step and live. The land of Israel becomes a land which takes an active role in the covenantal paradigm between the people of Israel and the God of Israel. It is a land who is commanded in the book of Leviticus chapter 25 to keep the Sabbath. We know it as Shemitah. It is a land whose fruit of its tree is rendered uncircumcised for three years until it is allowable to be given to the Kohanim and on the fifth year it is rendered edible. The fruit of the tree of the land of Israel has orla, a foreskin. Check it out. And my friend, it is a land that takes an active role in the act of tzedakah, leket, 
Pe'a, shichecha. It is the land that gives to the orphan, that gives to the widow, that gives to the needy, that gives to the destitute. It is not merely a geography. It is a theography. And this land ends when our people are expelled. And when they are expelled, this covenantal land now becomes part of our collective memory as a remembered land. It infuses itself from the physical to the mythical and trenches itself into our collective memory, into our liturgy, into our texts. It becomes our homeland irrespective of the land which is our home. No matter where we sit, we will never say in Passover, Le Shana Ba in Kansas City. And I have nothing against Kansas City. <laughs> we'll say Le Shana Ba Yerushalayim, even if it remains a yet unfulfilled promise. That remembered land changes abruptly in 1948, where this remembered land now becomes a lived land. It is a land now that needs to brush reality against mythology, real politic against the narrative of old. It is no longer just a land of Israel, a theography. It is a modern, democratic entity in the Middle East that aspires to live among the nations of the world and sustain a Jewish backbone in a modern context. And it brings with it incredible, incredible challenges. And the last landscape is Israel envisioned, which I dare say affects us all. What is the envisioned trajectory of the land of Israel? What is the envisioned trajectory of the state of Israel based on all those previous landscapes that are all intertwined in our collective memories? That 16-year-old Pisher spoke to me about an imagined land while I was hearing a lived land. And it took me a while to take a step back and realize that he is looking at the same wall, but he's seeing something completely different. And it was an enchanting moment. But as Rabbi Nachman of Breslev once said, there is no menorah without its foibles. And we have great challenges when it comes to Jewish and Israel education. And I'm going to illustrate four. Number one, not just with Jewish and Israel education, but in general, we live in an era where there is a great disparity between incredible accessibility to information and the ability or the desire of people to delve into knowledge in depth. We live in, a, we live in a generation of surfers without a diving license. They surf, they don't dive. By extension, and that is absolutely truth when it comes to Israel education and Jewish education, among our Jewish youngsters, we live in a generation where there is a growing disparity between low levels of knowledge and very high levels of opinion. My grandfather once put it beautifully. He said the difference between a wise person and a stupid person is that a stupid person, person thinks they know. A wise person knows they think. There are a lot of people out there who think they know. And we as educators need to deal with that preconceived assumption that they arrive with. Point number three. We have raised generations of Jews Perceiving Judaism primarily through the lens of religion in the myopic sense of the word. Nobody argues with the fact that religion is an integral and core component of the Jewish experience. But anybody who suggests that it encompasses the Jewish experience is wrong. And we have raised generations of Jews believing that Judaism is solely a religious following. Associated with rituals, with liturgy, with texts with behaviors, abruptly put, we raise generations of Jews to learn how to be Jewish. We haven't set the time, the effort, and the intellectual rigor to teach them why to be Jewish. This triumph of ritual over meaning yields only one thing in a historical perspective. Teach a generation about rituals devoid of meaning and this generation will end up losing both. And the fourth point, 
a lot of our younger generations, and not just the younger one, perceive Israel primarily, if not exclusively, through the land of the conflict, with an uppercase T and an uppercase C, as if there are no other layers to this intricate landscape that I just outlined, as if the conflict encapsulates the life of Israel in its entirety. How do we deal with those challenges? Number one, I would suggest we need to change our language. And we need to change our education language on two fronts. Number one, change the language of ritual into a language of meaning. Let's have our educational system deal with the question of why before they deal with the question of how. And once the participants understand the why, I strongly believe they will lend themselves to the how in a more favorable way. Number two, change the rhetoric of crisis into a rhetoric of opportunity. My friends, we Jews have mastered the rhetoric of crisis as a major mobilizing factor and identity formation tool. I'm quoting someone else who said, in the Jewish world, there is no better business than Shoah business. And I'm not undermining the importance of the Shoah, of course. Don't get me wrong. But all I'm saying is for us to understand that a body cannot sustain itself healthily if it is primarily nourished on a diet of tragedies. A Jewish backbone needs to sustain itself on a language of pride from the inner mechanisms of Jewish life rather than the language of fear of external threats to Jewish life. I am not proud to be Jewish because of the Holocaust. I'm proud of being Jewish in spite of the Holocaust. And there lies the difference. Point number two, education at its core, my friends, has to be much more humbling than gratifying. It is not a commodity. And the student is not a customer. It doesn't begin at one point and end at another. I am not here to satisfy a teenager. I'm here to become a blissful irritation to their intellect. <laughs> I'm here to frustrate them, to push them beyond their zone of Jewish comfort. I am here to take their exclamation points and re-massage them into question marks again. I'm here to teach them that befriending ambiguity is the sure sign of a soul on its way to maturity. And the third point, let us never confuse between our unifying values and the unity we have in our beliefs sometimes and the uniformity in its expressions. We may believe in the same things and decide or opt to express them in radically different ways. And I have news for you. It's always been like that in Jewish life. Disagreement is a bliss. It is the fuel that ignites Jewish evolution, not a threat to it. And if we're able to cultivate generations who understand that, they will join the table in a meaningful discussion. I would like to conclude with a blessing that appears in Midrash Rabbah and is one of a blessing that is mostly unknown to Jews, irrespective of their denomination, or even education. Maybe because the rabbis decreed that this blessing will never be recited unless one stands before of 600,000 Jews or Lehavdil, the Messiah himself. But I took the liberty to deviate from that dictum because I think it's important that every Jew should know this blessing. If one enters a room and sees a multitude of Jews like I'm looking at you right now, he should recite, Blessed are you, God, the wise of all secrets. Now listen to this. For just as their faces are different from one another, so are their opinions different from one another. And each one possesses his or her own mind. Our unique sanctity as individuals is an integral part of the diversity that fuels Jewish life. That will never change. Education needs to change in order to articulate that. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching Eli Talks. Click through or subscribe to the Eli Talks channel for more inspired Jewish ideas.